What is up, folks? I'm coming to you from one of the most gorgeous Airbnbs I think I've ever personally stayed at. I mean, just look at the kitchen back there. It's kind of crazy. I did an awesome dinner here last night, but you're here for one reason, and that's to hear my answers to the questions that you folks asked in this month's Ask JK. Thank you for everyone that submitted questions or upvoted other people's questions. If you want to see that your question did indeed get covered in the episode before the video gets released, I pin a little heart comment on all the ones that I am going to answer, and that helps me uh, see which ones I am actually going to answer in these videos. I got to say, I chuckled a little bit at the question that you folks upvoted the most, but that's going to be later in the video because I want that watch time. All right, Joe O, my videographer, the guy who left me and moved to San Francisco, asks the biggest unlock I experienced while working at a restaurant. Aside from like doing chore yard work stuff for neighbors of mine and like a small stint that I did at a farm for a girl that I used to date, I didn't really have a job before I found kitchens. And so what really what kitchens really gave me was a sense of like discipline and then team dynamics. And that happens with most young people, right? We want to get away from our parents. We can tend to be selfish, especially uh, before we have been humbled in certain ways. And that was the quickest thing that happened when I got to kitchens is like, you don't know anything. And there's so many things that you don't even have a grasp of conceptually yet. So trying to keep this mindful as a takeaway for you, I think that even if you don't see that restaurants are going to be the end all be all for you. I think your experience working in hospitality in any fashion, whether that's a hotel or like a bakery even, will those those skills that you learn there will transcend and go beyond whatever you decide to do with your life. I, I feel like it's going to make me a better parent. It's, it makes me better in my relationships. It makes me just a better person overall having the experience of working in the hospitality industry. Then if I'm going to answer that selfishly, the biggest unlock was truly figuring out that this is what I wanted to do for a career, for my job. I think most of you know that I was on the math team and I played jazz trumpet and I was a cross country and track runner and I had a group of friends that we were really into concerts and music and I did photography. I did so many things in high school and food, like working in restaurants was the first time when I truly saw something and latched onto it and I was like, I can get paid for this, I enjoy doing it, and it brings value to the world. And that was like the hugest unlock for me, if I had to say. All right, Blood Brethren Games says, what tips do you have for people who want to serve a large group of people with impressive food given a relatively restrictive budget? I certainly hope you watch the Dish of the Day video where I made Chipino for about 50 people on a really restricted budget. That video is up here. But if you really dig into it and think about what are those things that normally break the budget, right? It's normally the proteins, right? The fish, shellfish, meat, the awful cuts. And then also those kind of rare and exotic ingredients, right? If you're using truffles or imported vinegars or yuzu or real wasabi. And so what I find, and this is something that I learned while I was working in Norway, my chef would actually like to season vegetable dishes with meat proteins, right? We would make like scallop XO sauce, or we would smoke mussels, or we would uh, take langoustines and make a sauce from the shells that would kind of like squeeze the most we could out of certain ingredients so that you could still get the flavor and still say that you were serving langoustines but it wasn't necessarily like every single person had to get a tail of langoustine. So I would encourage you to explore and research some of these dishes where like you're using batarga in pasta or you're making foie gras as a seasoning in the farce for uh, ravioli or if you're using truffles to infuse your rice for risotto. Making roasted potatoes as like a side dish but instead of using pork as a main course you're deciding to like get guanciale that you slice super thin and kind of like layer over the roasted potatoes and then it kind of renders the fat a little bit. That would be delicious. Because then you're also thinking about what are kind of those starchy foods, the ones that fill people up quite a bit, where you get a little bit more bang for your buck, and then you can afford to have that extra budget to buy those more impressive ingredients. I find that cooking like that also makes you a little bit more creative as well, where it's not as easy as just searing Wagyu and serving that. You have to use your brain a little bit to how am I going to make this tastier with this constraint. I'm going to butcher this name. Mr. Espman asks, what are my top five go-to quick meals or ways to spice up boring or cheap dinners? This is so interesting that this got asked because Anna and I probably do rotate through like the seven or eight basic meals that we make at home all the time. To do a quickie rundown of that, it's typically like a coconut based curry. I'll usually do chicken or prawns in that. Anna really likes when I make like a beef stroganoff with mushrooms. That's like a pasta dish. Especially if we're eating out a lot, I will often make like the giant salad bowl where it's literally just like torn bread croutons, maybe a protein, 
couple vegetables from like our garden in the back and then just tons and tons of leafy greens. The classic like spaghetti bolognese, we eat a lot of pasta. And then probably the last one is like a what's in the walk-in stir fry kind of thing where I just make like some steamed rice with sesame in it and then just a ton of different vegetables. And if I have protein lying around, I'll do that too. And usually when I'm cooking for us at home, I make enough for four people so then both of us can have lunch the next day. And if you're thinking about spicing up boring or cheap meals, I think see the answer that I just gave of, you know, trying to maybe splurge on a little bit of an exotic ingredient where if I was making my beef stroganoff and I wouldn't normally put truffle in it, I think it would breathe new life into making that dish if I were to use truffle or a different balsamic. And it doesn't even have to be using truffle, right? Instead of using black pepper in my sauce, maybe what if I tried using green peppercorns? I also find that sometimes if you get bored with shopping at the same places that you always get your ingredients and you have the luxury of having a farmer's market near you, maybe go do the shopping at a place where you can talk to the person that maybe even grew or produced the stuff that you're eating and then you'll have a different connection to what you're cooking and preparing. Okay, moving on. Joshua Thompson asks, what's the most important advice you have for incoming students at the CI? IA. They say this, everybody says this at CIA, but you really have to hit the ground running. I spoke with someone just the other night at the Corin event, and they were like, I'm in fundamentals class. When is too soon or too late to start staging places? And I know the block structure has changed a little bit where I had skills class and now it's fundamentals class, but I sent out my stage inquiry for Le Bernardin 10 weeks into culinary school. And I had no experience at a Michelin restaurants, period. I definitely went more external with how I tried to use CIA to my advantage, but I've seen a lot of people who have tons of success keeping it all at CIA, right? You make great relationships with your peers, you latch on to certain professors, and then you ultimately become like a teaching assistant, or you have an instructor that gives you hookups at certain restaurants, or gets you into different programs, or you get scholarships through that kind of stuff. And I guess the biggest advice I could give is yes, it's tons of fun to meet people and hang out on campus and do all those college things, especially if you're coming straight out of high school. But CIA, especially if you're doing the associate's degree program, goes by so fast because your externship happens and and you're right back to it, and before you know it, you've graduated. And most of you have probably heard this quote, but the comfort zone is great, but nothing grows there. And so I would argue the same. You can have all these amazing things happen, but it's not gonna happen if you just stay in your dorm room. Plus, I think using the student card is so underrated. So many people will give you the time of day because you say that you're a student and you're doing things. I think that's super underrated. All right, next question comes from Alex Liang. In my opinion, what's the best way for a line cook to move up the ranks? For example, what can someone who works on Garmage move on to some tougher stations? I think that's really important to acknowledge, whether it's politics and people that have been there longer than you or have different, people are playing favorites and that's preventing you from moving up, or is it there's a skill gap that's preventing you from moving up? And with questions like this, I'll look to you, Alex, because you know your restaurant better than I do. What do the gatekeepers that are making the decisions that have people move up, what do they want? Are they struggling with upholding standards? Is it really frustrating for them to get their orders in? Is organization a problem? Do Does the line have problems with communication? And if those people, the ones making the decisions, can visibly see in you that you possess those traits and will continue to grow if they put you in the positions to succeed, I think it's just a matter of time and patience after that to make sure that you see that progression. And I also realize this is restaurant dependent, but I've talked with people in the past who have been like waiting for ages and ages and ages to get moved up in the brigade and then all of a sudden someone gives their notice and oh, bravo, there you go, you got your spot. So things can sometimes happen faster than you think, but I've certainly had cases where I've been held back and that was just because of my, at like my attitude was not good enough. I wasn't invested enough and I didn't have the standards myself to make sure that I was showcasing those qualities that were worthy of getting moved up in the ranks. Next question comes from Zach. He says, what is the difference between organizing my station for cooking a tasting menu versus a restaurant that does a la carte? Are there any tricks to either help better set up your station for success? I think the biggest benefit for cooking a tasting menu comes from the predictable flow that happens, right? What are those things that happens when the ball starts here and then it tips over a bottle and then the domino things goes and then the ball comes down the thing? When the expediter says, order in for two, two tasting, the chef who's doing snacks or canapes springs right into action because they know exactly what to do. And then the person who's on roast knows to pull out two portions of lamb. And then the entremet person knows to portion out sauce for this many people. Shout out to everyone that got triggered or actually called back when I did that expo call. And then if you're doing things like marking your board and making sure you're keeping track of all the orders that come in, it's very difficult to fall behind when you're doing exclusively tasting menu things because you know exactly what's coming. I feel like the tricky thing that often happens with a la carte services is that it's very easy to get blindsided, right? With tasting menu restaurants especially, it's very easy to kind of spread the load across the kitchen. And I know that doesn't always happen, but when you're in a la carte restaurant, if someone, if you just got written up in food and wine about a certain dish that you have and you're on that station, you're probably gonna get wrecked during service because everyone's 
gonna order the same thing. I do actually need to do a video on marking your board because when you ask for tips or tricks to set your station up better for success, that's the one that was a true unlock for me. And the funniest thing is the first real a la carte cooking on the line experience that I had, I was juggling doing a tasting menu and an a la carte thing at the same time. So at least for Kit, we would do a four and seven course tasting menu, but then we would have an, a seating in the bar where you could order you know, different things off of a separate bar menu that we had. And I think if I had to offer any tips on that front, it would be to use a concept that is called batching. So if you get an order for Skate Almondine and then you get another order for Skate Almondine two minutes later, don't make the first one and then make the second one. You've reached kind of a critical mass where you can make two at the same time. And I feel like that's kind of a no-brainer, but I see it happen so often where people won't take the time to restart the project so that you can finish two at the same time instead of finish one and then finish another one. I specifically had that happen when I staged at this restaurant here in New York actually called Oceana where I was making some snacks or canapes for the beginning of the service. And I remember I was doing a two top and then a four top order came in and I was trying to finish the two top and I really got screamed at by the sous chef of like, make six at the same time, don't make two and then make four more. I'm so happy you folks asked these questions because I feel like some of these like really embarrassing moments early on in my career, I just black out because I'm so embarrassed by them. And then they come up again during these Q and A's. Question from Brittany J. What are the unexpected scenario things that I came across when I took my first sous chef job, whether it's an eye opener or a learning lesson? The biggest struggle I had is that I got promoted from within, right? I didn't get hired on as a sous chef. So the st biggest struggle I had because I was so homey homey with the entire line, basically the entire kitchen team, was that I went from being like a member of the gang to going to managing them. And I was like on a different, I had to be responsible for them. And I really struggled because I didn't wanna be the yelling, screaming manager chef. And Chef Chris would tell me that. He would say, you're being too nice. You need to be more firm. You need to be more assertive. And I of course found my own way to do that and manage and be effective with a team. But I think if I had to distill the biggest kind of macro lesson that I learned, it was that when Chef Chris, the owner of Lise Verkit wasn't there. And when my other sous chef was gone, because we had split shifts, I became the last line of defense for the restaurant. Fish doesn't come in, my fault. Table six said they were no shellfish, but we still serve them langoustine, my fault. A handmade plate that we just bought for $40 just drops and breaks, my fault. There's enough people that are way more talented than me that write books and give keynote speeches on management, but I think that was one of my biggest takeaways and one of my biggest points of pride was that I thought of it as I work for my team, they don't work for me. Because with any of those scenarios I brought up, you could argue that I could have pointed fingers at anybody else. I could point at the fish purveyor for the fish not coming. I could point to any of my chef de parties for taking too long to plate up a dish. But if I think back to all the opportunities I've been given to take personal ownership of something, it's been a no-brainer to do it and it's paid dividends for me. Nicolas Andreas asks, Hey Justin, wondering if I can get your thoughts on the importance of being fit as a chef and how one manages to implement a routine into their insanely long and strenuous work hours. I feel like this is something that's never been explored in depth before and I thought it would really be interesting to get insight on this topic. I personally think that just overall health and wellness is a topic that we can dive in and talk about for hours on this channel. It took me a really long time to prioritize it. I just said so in a podcast that just dropped earlier this week and I've certainly had coworkers, you too have probably had people in your life who because of this industry have bad backs, bad knees, they're overweight or they develop diseases that they shouldn't have at their age. It just comes along with lack of sleep, bad diet, too much stress, any of the above. And that's why I wanna be cautious with giving this advice because I could say, well, you should implement 45 minutes of exercise into your day, but if you are working 14 hours, you're commuting an hour to and from work, which most of you said in the Chrome knife bag video, it averaged around an hour each way for a commute. That math is 16 hours. So if I'm asking you to take 45 minutes out of that day and then you have to you know, shower and practice some personal hygiene, now you don't have eight hours of sleep. Right, so am I gonna advise you to take sleep away and supplement with exercise? Like it's a spectrum, right? And that's why I say this bigger picture of overall wellness and health is much more important to talk about rather than just being fit. If I had to prioritize and you are someone who is thinking a little bit more thoughtfully about your health, I would prioritize sleep first. There's a great book that most people have circulated around the internet called Why We Sleep. I was the type of person that used to tell my mom growing up when I was like a little, little kid that I thought sleeping was a waste of time. I've certainly changed that habit now. I wear a sleep tracking ring. It's not on my finger right now, but I've taken sleep in so much of a higher priority in my life lately. And I see this so frequently, especially in industry people that use substances, whether it's alcohol or sleep medications or antihistamines to get to sleep. 
I don't think that that's the right way to do it. I think if you can get your sleep on lockdown, that's going to be the most beneficial for you because that affects your memory. And if, if what I don't want to see is for you to start exercising and then have shitty sleep because your sleep affects your recovery. So you're shooting yourself in the foot if you're getting bad sleep and exercising because you're not getting the full benefits out of your exercise. And then I think it's another multi-layered question on why are you exercising? What does fit mean to you, right? Do you want more mobility? Do you want to be able to squat down and grab plates off the bottom shelf without any pain in your knees? Do you want to lose some weight so you aren't tired when you get to the top of the stairs after you're running up, up and down the stairs in the restaurant? Do you want to be able to lift trays with 16 chickens on them? I've certainly been there. I've developed different routines now, but I'm not working in restaurants anymore. So I'm always very cautious to give that kind of advice because I have more time on my hands than I did when I was working as a chef de partie. I do want to dive deeper in on this because it's something that I've been increasingly fascinated with over the past probably 12 to 18 months. There are some great channels that I found as great resources. So Matt Diavella's channel, he talks all about healthy habits and growing those habits. Um, James Clear has a book called Atomic Habits, where if you're talking about routines, that's been really, really beneficial for me. And I think the biggest thing if you're wanting to make a change is there's so many like free yoga routines on YouTube or high intensity interval training that you can do that takes less than 10 minutes a day. And if you can even just start with that, just to get your blood flowing or increase your mobility, I find that you will either have more energy during the day, or if you then have trouble sleeping, because you did some exercise, you will be more tired at the end of the day and that will help you sleep, right? They're all connected. All right, next question comes from James Ramsey. It says, hi, Justin, love your videos. Apologies if I've already answered this question. You're currently a culinary student. You're not from the US. You're planning on working at high-end restaurants in the future. Do you have any tips for someone like me who's planning on moving to a country where you have basically no connections? You wanna get noticed and accepted by restaurants. I think anybody who started in this industry can attest to the fact that it is such a small world. I think I posted on my Instagram yesterday this photo of this chef that I worked for at a random sake event that my culinary school partnered with when we, us students helped these different chefs from Japanese restaurants. I ran into him here at Corin. I think that can be a little bit intimidating starting from zero and that truly is the hardest part going from zero to to one because going from one to 10 after that is so much easier. That once you get here to the US, your work will speak for itself and that is can be good or bad, right? You can say, oh man, I have so much more to work on and improve. Or you can say, oh, well, I'm actually like leaps and bounds ahead of some of these people. And then you're gonna, you are gonna get noticed and you are gonna move up in the ranks pretty fast. What I found, especially on the higher end of restaurants, if you're working in fine dining places, most restaurants have kind of a diverse group of people that are coming from different areas of the world. And so you're gonna naturally get attracted to these people who have the same experience as you. And those people are also probably far from home and had to make sacrifices to be there. And I think you're gonna instantly connect over that. I'd actually be curious to hear from you folks, the ones that listened this far into the videos. If I started like a Discord or a Facebook group, I mean, sometimes it happens on Patreon when I do a post and people engage in the comments or even here on YouTube. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But if there was a, a place to come where I would kind of be a moderator for it almost and encourage the conversation, pose some questions, would that bring you folks any value? I'd love to know down low in the comments if you can think of something where, you know, you can ask a question like this and, you know, you can say, hey guys, I'm moving to San Francisco and I'm moving here from London and I don't really know what to expect. What should I uh, be thinking about? And then other people who are either in San Francisco can say, hey, I want to meet up with you and learn a little bit more about you. I think that would be awesome. And if I could provide value through my community in that way to help you folks, that would be great. But let me know what your thoughts are on something like that. Okay, you savages. The last question from Samuel Siahan, which apparently a lot of people wanted to hear the stories about, which is the worst mistake I've ever did in one of the upscale restaurants I've ever worked in. Man, bringing back my PTSD. All right, so the first story that comes to mind that was very traumatic for me was when I was an externet per se. We were doing a dish for the private dining room, and I want to say it was like between 40 and 60 portions of a salad of mushrooms. I think it was like an escabeche, like a pickled mushroom salad that was either served as a salad or it was a garnish for something. And I was tasked with washing the morel mushrooms. And for those of you that work with morel mushrooms in the past know that they can be pretty dirty especially if they're, you know, foraged and tossed in a box with a bunch of other morels and you get dirt inside of the mushroom. And this process at per se was all about trying to keep them whole. And so I wasn't cutting them open in any way. So it was, you know, washing in one large cambro and then you would 
pick the mushrooms up out of the cambro and move them into a new cambro with water. And then you would jostle them around a little bit and then move them to another uh, bucket of fresh water. It was probably two or three weeks into my externship at Per Se. Most people didn't even know what my name was. And what ended up happening was I washed the mushrooms six or seven times. I, looking back on it now, I don't think I was aggressive enough in jostling the mushrooms around to get the dirt to come out of them. Long story short, they weren't clean. There was dirt in the mushrooms and it got put into this salad of, you know, 60 other portions of really expensive mushrooms. And most of you know that morels are very expensive. They ended up getting like diced up and put into the thing, which is weird that I couldn't wash them after they were cut because I would argue that that would make it them easier to clean. But anyways, traumatic story. I got stopped in front of the entire brigade, got screamed at because the mushrooms weren't clean, and then I had to stand there in front of everyone with my tweezers and pick out the pieces of morel mushrooms from the salad until they were all gone. Man, that was so traumatic. And what's funny is when you have these experiences, they stick out and you never look at morel mushrooms the same ever again. You know exactly what to look for to make sure that a morel mushroom is clean. Okay, I'm gonna tell one more bonus story because this has got more upvotes than the f previous, probably all the questions combined, I wanna say. There was this phase at the restaurant in Norway where I was super overwhelmed with getting things done. I was trying to manage a morning team with the apprentices, obviously the dinner service. I was also in charge of doing all the butchering. And so what sucked was cod or sai, which was the typical fish that we would use in Norway, took a long time to butcher. And because we would have to order so many kilos a week, I would save time by ordering fish that didn't require so much involvement. And that fish for us was halibut. The problem was halibut was so crazy expensive. And I had just had a meeting, it was a finance meeting, where I was specifically told that my food cost was too high and I needed to lower it. And most of you that manage food costs know that waste can be just as big of a part of your food cost as how much you're buying or how much you're paying for certain ingredients. And so I had just bought and butchered all of this halibut and we were just coming off of our weekend. We were closed two days a week and there was a couple that came and sat in the bar. They were from Germany and I had this halibut that was from Friday and we were serving it to them on a Tuesday. And typically because we got the fish in so fresh, most of the time the fish was like day of caught. It wasn't really that big of an issue for the fish to sit that long. But for whatever reason, whatever could have happened over the weekend, that halibut wasn't great. And I was so stressed out with not wanting to throw this fish away that I told my chef de partie that we were going to serve this to this couple from Germany in the bar. So we serve them the fish and they call over a server and they say, we don't think this fish is all that fresh. Server comes back to me. I assure the server to tell them it is fresh fish, which was the wrong thing to do. And then as I did with most guest complaints, I liked to be fully transparent with my boss and he was working in the office. I go to tell the chef, hey, there's this couple from Germany. They're a little bit concerned with the freshness of the fish. And he asked me point blank, he said, is the fish good or not? And me being a naive new sous chef, I said, the fish is totally fine. I don't know why they're being difficult guests, but I think you should go talk to them. He goes out in the dining room, talks to the couple, defends the fish, ultimately defends me, and then comes back into the kitchen, goes on meat station, looks in the drawer, smells the fish, picks up a filet where I'm over at the butchery station, kind of like in my own little zone, has a filet of halibut, and then he says, get out of the way. And then he throws the filet of fish up against the wall. Man, I smelled that fish and I could immediately tell, I was like, that is not good. It's pretty traumatic, right? Yeah, that was a not a good experience where I totally learned the value of standing behind your product and not serving something if you don't feel 100% about it. Man, having you folks make me relive these memories, my palms are all sweaty. You're making me nervous bring up, uh, bringing up all these stories. But I think that that's important where sometimes in the moment, what you perceive as being the problem is not the ultimately the lesson that you learned and then being able to reflect back on it from a different place can be super, super valuable. And if it ultimately helps you think about the story that Justin told that one time about the fish, that will help you in your journey and you won't make the same mistakes that I did. Because the funny thing about these stories too is that you're still gonna make mistakes because I can cover 15 stories that cover different things and you're gonna be like, yep, Justin told me about this stuff, I'm not gonna do that. But then all the things that I got right that I don't tell you about, those are gonna be the mistakes you're gonna make. So I can never make you fully bulletproof. I can just tell you about what I fucked up on. All right, that's gonna do it for this month. If you submitted a question, if you liked a question, if you even thought about answering a question, but you're gonna do it next month, thank you. Because every single comment and share and, you know, 
you asking a question and having me answer it is probably also not just going to help you, but it's going to help more people. And I really like doing these videos, especially when I can do them from an awesome, uh, you know, Airbnb that's gorgeous in Brooklyn. I'm going back to Seattle tomorrow, unfortunately, but I really wanted to shoot this and get it out to you folks. Videos like this on YouTube are free. They're always going to be free from me, but if you do want to financially support what I'm trying to do with this whole channel and this project and this brand, I would love for you to support my content on Patreon. That's of course linked down below as always. Always. If you didn't get your question answered, there's always next month. Thank you so much for your attention. My name is Justin Kana. Have a good one.